Episode 15 with Donuts and Deadlifts founder, competitive powerlifter, and owner of Black Iron Gym, Chrissy May Cagney. Welcome back, everybody. Thank you all so much for joining me again this week. We have yet another amazing episode lined up for you. I am your host, Chase Tuning, and this is Ever Forward Radio. Episode 15, I can't believe we made it so far. It feels like I've been doing this forever, but uh, hard to believe we're only 15 episodes deep, and it's only been just a couple months. Today's guest is especially inspiring because not only is it amazing the progress and success that she has had thus far in her powerlifting career, her entrepreneurship, her business, but really as an individual and the dark valleys that she has had to climb out of to reach such a great level of success. I couldn't think of anyone who has worked as hard or who has earned this as much as Chrissy May Cagney. For any of you who have experienced or know anyone who has gone through a substance or alcohol abuse, you know the darkness that surrounds that. And for someone to be as involved as she was and still in the fitness community speaks in and of itself of the amount of mental fortitude and just perseverance and grit that I really think she possesses that has really helped her land on her feet and find that barbell salvation. So before we get into the interviews, I wanted to go back in to do another iTunes podcast review of the week. Again, thank you guys for consistently dropping these ratings and reviews. These are really the ways that help the podcast grow the most. The ratings and reviews are the ways that attracts more attention to this platform and really kind of helps us bring in phenomenal guests and just have that ever forward awareness. So again, I greatly appreciate it. Really looking forward to continuing to provide this content, these topics, these guests, and just be a platform to help you live a life ever forward. This review comes from Lucky Lucky Lou, and they write, I have thoroughly enjoyed listening to this podcast so far. It has great structure and is packed with very thoughtful questions. Everford is as powerful as it is simple, and I think it's a fantastic theme to center our podcast around. I'm excited for what's to come. Well, lucky, lucky Lou, you're not the only one. I, am, I get more excited week by week by the amazing people that I'm able to connect with and the amazing conversations, really, and the stories that I am able to learn more about and pull out of these people who have accomplished such great things and really realizing all of their successes and failures and lessons learned that, that we could all apply and have a benefit to in our own lives. So again, if you're on iTunes, please head over to the podcast. Go ahead and just tap the icon, click write a review. All you need to do is just tap that five-star button. And if you're feeling extra lovely that day, I would greatly appreciate a review. The ratings and reviews really help the channel grow, like I said, and uh, we're looking forward to just spreading the reach even further, bringing on even more great and inspiring guests, and spreading the Everford message. So without further ado, I'm going to dive right into this week's episode, my interview with Donuts and Deadlift's very own Mrs. Chrissy May Cagney. Hey, what's going on, everybody? I'm back here this week with another episode of Everford Radio with none other than Mrs. Donuts and Deadlift's herself. I'm staring at her. You can't see her. Sometimes I forget we're in an audio world with this podcast. But uh, I'm with Miss Chrissy May Cagney. Chrissy, how's it going? Good. How are you? I'm doing super duper. I got to say, anybody who has the middle name May is extra cool with me because that's actually my wife's name. It's her middle name, too. Is it M-A-E? It's M-A-Y. Uh -huh. M-A-Y. Yeah. The M-A-E is a Hawaiian thing, I think. Okay. Maybe hers is a, she's Iranian, so maybe M-A-Y okay. is a brown thing and yeah, uh, M-A-E is a foreign thing. <laughs> I can say that because my wife's brown. It's okay. Yes. <laughs> um, so like I said, Chrissy, I, I know her predominantly from the donuts and deadlifts world. And we were just talking before the interview that I honestly, up until about two days ago, didn't even know it was her baby. I just got caught up in a, a powerlifting contest. One time I was watching my brother. I saw donuts and just made a beeline straight for the <laughs> for your shack. Uh, it was here in D.C. actually about three years ago, and ever since then I just I follow you guys on all social media. I mean I'm always the guy going to the gym and then immediately going to get donuts afterwards, which was kind of the origin story behind that too. So uh, I'll let you dive in, kind of just explain. I said we're definitely cut from the same cloth. Cut from the same donut. Yeah, there we go. 
<laughs> so Chrissy, why don't you uh, explain yourself, explain to the people who you are, what you do, uh, and kind of just, you know, your, your origin story. I went through college, like personal training. And then after I graduated from college, um, I went to school for criminal justice. So the goal was originally go to law school, but it was kind of like right when all the Instagram fitness stuff took off. So I just kind of bailed on school and then moved down to LA. That's where I started donuts and deadlifts, ended up moving to New York. Um, I wrote two books and then I was just saving all the money I had from all that. And then all that money allowed me to open the gym, mm-hmm. which was about two years ago. And then now I also own an outdoor brand. Okay, wow. So you have about... <laughs> There's a very condensed... <laughs> <laughs> you have about uh, eight different babies in that story as far as uh, unpacking, <laughs> I guess. Um, yeah. So let's let's go back to the first thing. Uh, I mentioned donuts and deadlifts. Where did that yeah. come from and why donuts, why deadlifts? So I've just been like a donut person since I was a baby. I've just always loved them. Uh, and, now so you, basically, and now you all know why I asked her to be on the radio. If you know anything about me, I love my donuts. Yeah, they've always been my favorite. So basically, it started as a joke. Um, I, when I started powerlifting, when I was living out in Southern California, I'd bring donuts to the gym on the weekends. Yeah. And uh, everybody else at the gym would like be like, oh, what are you doing? That's so bad for you. And they'd make fun of me. So I started hashtagging donuts and deadlifts just to like get a rise out of people and like provoke my coworkers. <laughs> like totally, totally just started as like a stupid, dumb thing of me thinking I was being funny. Yeah. And then other people started using the hashtag on stuff. And I was like, hmm. So I created an Instagram at first with like no plans on ever selling a t-shirt in my life. And I was like, Oh, this is just going to be a really funny Instagram with pictures of like donuts and like people, you know? So yeah. it started off as like a travel guide. Cause I used to travel to do seminars. So anytime we, we travel somewhere, I would like be like Boston, this is like the best gym here. And this is the best donut shop. So that went on for like three months. And the next thing you know, the Instagram following had like 8,000 followers and then uh, my buddy who does like branding and brand identity was like, yeah. please yeah. let me make you a design and sell t-shirts. You got a thing here for sure, yeah. But I was like, no, that's stupid. I don't want to be that fitness person selling t-shirts. And he's like, just completely remove your name from it. So we did it and I got like 100 shirts made and they sold out in like two minutes. I was like, okay. So you're, you're like, uh, <laughs> like the, the Batman of fitness and donuts. You just you removed <laughs> – Removed the self from it and uh, yep, became exactly. you became what the industry needed, not not who they needed. <laughs> kind of just happened like very like organically and unplanned. Yeah. That's usually how the best things in life turn out to be, right? Yeah. It's, it's something that just yeah. uh, happens out of accident and you just roll yeah, with it, right? Exactly. Yeah. Now before donuts and before deadlifts, you were born into this world. Um, mm-hmm. So what's it like coming from a family where you just kind of like? not necessarily force fed, but I mean, you grew up with, you know, surrounding yourself by fitness and exercise and, you know, that active lifestyle. Um, my parents are incredible Mm -hmm. athletes. Like, uh, my dad was doing the escape from Alcatraz triathlon up until he was about like 55 and like doing well competitive with the younger guys. So my parents are both the type of people that cannot do any type of fitness for a year and then go pop off like a five minute mile. (laughs) So (laughs) They're like incredible endurance athletes, okay. both of them. Um, so that's kind of where I get that from. So yeah, I mean, I was just born. That's all I knew when I was little. Like weekends were spent going to races, and you know, I, I did my first triathlon when I was like eight. Was eight like years old triathlete. Yeah, my parents would put me in kid, the kid triathlons. <laughs> yeah. I didn't even know that was a thing. That's insane. Yeah. So, and then I would do races with my dad because there's always youth division in races. Okay. So we'd go like run a 10K or something and I'd be in like the 10 to 12 year old bracket or whatever. So I definitely grew up very, very active. Okay. Now I noticed yeah. you're not necessarily doing triathletes anymore, right? Um, I'm going to get back into it this summer actually. Oh, yeah. Just sprints. Yeah. Cause I don't have to train much for that, but I still, I, I ride my bike, my road bike almost every day in the summer and I swim once a week. So. Yeah, I got to say every time, well, maybe about every other picture I see of you on Instagram or Twitter, it's you're either in the gym, at a donut store, or <laughs> hiking or camping somewhere. So yeah, it's one of those much. three things. <laughs> yeah. It's well-rounded, absolutely. Yeah. Going from kind of in the household of where it's fitness, everything, you guys obviously kind of had uh, that that 
common denominator with your family. Um, mm-hmm. Segwaying into like middle school, high school, and going through college, uh, you put it out there. I know that you have kind of a long standing history of not always being in that fitness lifestyle yeah. mindset. And you struggled with some demons going through, I guess, your teenage years and early 20s mm-hmm. before you really got your feet solidified in what you're doing now. Can you talk a little bit more about that and what yeah. that process was like? So I grew up in Hawaii. That's where I was born. And um, we moved from Hawaii to Reno. And I think it was just kind of like culture shock to mm-hmm. me. You know, I grew up with the beach and doing triathlons and being outdoors all the time. And next thing you know, we're moving to summer that's got snow. Yeah. And then my parents went through a divorce and I just didn't handle it very well. And it just, I started drinking in middle school, which it seemed like everybody did at I don't know. Maybe, maybe that was just me, but, and then the drug use started when I was about 16 in high school. And I, my, the other thing too, that happened is my little sister had open heart surgery. Um, and it definitely, because of the age it happened at, Mm -hmm. there was a lot of like taking care of her and making sure she was okay. Cause she was really sick and she had open heart surgery yeah. and my parents by no means neglected me. They're both great, incredible parents. But I think some of that had something to do with her cause everything was always about her while she was sick and recovering and stuff. So I just started acting out. Um, it started young and then it just carried over into the drug use in high school. Yeah. I graduated from high school and then in college, the drug use was really bad. I went to rehab three times and use the day I got out every time. (laughs) So this wasn't just a recreational thing. This was kind of a hard and heavy every time. Uh, My freshman year of college, I definitely got a chemical dependency Mm -hmm. to drugs where I acted, I acted crazy when I wasn't on them and acted completely normal when I was. So that was really hard to break free from. But yeah, the drug use carried on basically until the day I moved to Southern California in like 2012. Wow. And which substances uh, were you abusing at the time? Um, mostly cocaine, but Uh there was like meth here and there, like ecstasy mall, you know, like the party drugs, but for the most part, it was always cocaine. And at the same time of the substance abuse problem, were you still heavily involved with uh, your triathlons and being active? How were you balancing that at all? Um, it was weird. I was just functional on it. (laughs) I think you were first. I (laughs) I mean, I graduated college being a cokehead, you know, and people here hear that and they're like that's incredible but I wouldn't I was that person that would like hold myself up in my room and do a bunch of drugs and do my homework <laughs> oh wow okay so you were like yeah. uh doing yeah. doing that but also adulting at the same time <laughs> yeah well the other thing too is I was very because uh, after I got out of rehab the second time I didn't tell anybody I started using again so I just kind of closed myself off to the world and just used by myself at home and never left the house I turned into like a mega hermit but um yeah, I, all through I did an Ironman when I was 19, mm-hmm. um, and that was one of the times where I wasn't using, and that's that's what I trained for. And then I tried to get into bodybuilding the second time I tried to get sober. And when you stop doing cocaine and you're 115 pounds, and then you like balloon up to a, not like 140 pounds is big for me. I'm more than that now, but when it's that quick weight gain when you're yeah. so skinny, and then I involved myself in a sport that is entirely based on how you look. And it just messed me up mentally. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, it just was, you know, back and forth like that. I hadn't ever like found my place, so to speak, in the fitness industry the entire time I was using. I was like personal training. Then I got into like spinning and then I got back into cycling. And then I was like triathlons, bodybuilding. And I was just kind of all over the place because mm-hmm. um, not find my fit in the fitness industry or competing or anything like that. I really think that uh, I mean, I mean, it's really kind of lighthearted to talk about how much you were, I guess, trying to do and doing, you know, substance abusing at the same time. I know a lot of people that you can you know, be a recreational drug user, or people have you know significant addiction problems, and they become what we all know as functioning addicts. But I really mm-hmm. think that in this type of job, in this profession, I mean, when it's you know how well you look, how well you perform, and how well you can coach and train others. Yeah. I mean, that balance to me is really mind blowing. I mean, were you just that at that level to where you were just performing on a high at all times? I mean, how did you really kind of just divide the two or did you at all? Oh, uh, I didn't sleep. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> so I had, I mean, I, I look at it now and realize it was like part insomnia, part okay. being a cokehead, but <laughs> just like being um, a zombie. Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't sleep. I'd be up all night. Like, I don't know. 
whether it was like homework or even after I graduated from college, it was writing training programs or reading. And I was just, I was always very, I've always been motivated and driven. Like I never once was like a junkie by any Mm means. I mean, some people would say that, but I, I never wound up in places. I know some of my other addict friends have, like I stayed active in school. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, like I was only briefly homeless once or twice. (laughs) Really? Wow. Yeah. But that's when I was like 18, 19 when it was at its worst. So even before college or like my freshman year of college, but then as I got into school and I'm really passionate about learning and I just have a thirst for knowledge and I loved school. I loved college. I Mm. I had no inclination to ever like skip class or not do my homework. Like I loved it. Um, so as I got more involved with college and school, like I kind of got my shit together, so to speak, but I also at the same time, I was still like actively using. And what were you studying at the time? Criminal justice. Well, I started school um, to into uh, sports medicine, and mm-hmm. then I went to University of Nevada, but they canceled the program um, after my mm-hmm. freshman year. So I had already gotten in a bunch of trouble, oh, so I knew the the legal system really well. <laughs> and I originally <laughs> you had the inside scoop. <laughs> I had been through like the court system four or five times at that point. Um, but what I wanted to do is I had a probation officer when, um, I, when I was still a minor. Mm -hmm. So when I was, I got a DU, my first DUI when I was 17, like right before I turned 18. Mm -hmm. And I had a probation officer that actually cared about me and wasn't just putting me through the system. Like he wanted me to get, get my shit together and go to school and graduate and have like an awesome fulfilling life. Mm -hmm. His mission Mm -hmm. wasn't to like bust my balls all the time. And so he really inspired me to want to get into that. So originally in school, I wanted to be a youth probation officer. Interesting. Yeah. So that's kind of where, as I was still using all through college and then, uh, then I decided I wanted to go to law school and maybe get, become an attorney. And then, um, yeah, obviously I took a different route. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, you were kind of going through this process. It really sounds like your probation officer was a catalyst for you in setting you on your current path now. Is that correct? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, it it was, I got two more DUIs, which kind of got me in a lot of trouble. But honestly, if anything, it helped me because I was under a microscope after Mm -hmm. that third one. Like you're supposed to go to prison after, you know, it's a felony in the state of Nevada. And so, I spent a lot of time on house arrest. I was, you know, getting random breath, drug tests, breathalyzer, everything like that for about a year. So, uh, yeah, it was, and then after that last year, I never got in trouble again. <laughs> so you, I heard you say that being under a microscope was kind of a good thing. Can you ex- yeah. expand upon that? How can being, you know, scrutinized or looked at all the time help us, you know, be better? How did it make you be better? Well, it's like, it's funny. It's like the same thing. The only thing I can relate it to is like with my nutrition clients, there's a lot of them know what they're doing. They're just paying for accountability at that point. And it's account of, yeah, it's an accountability thing. It's knowing you have to check in and like my nutrition clients, they know they have to check in with me every week. So when they're actively checking in and they know it's coming, they're on top of their shit a little bit more. And it was same with me. Like as a okay. cop could have shown up at my house at any time to see if there was alcohol in the house to breathalyze me, to drug test me, anything like that. So like, you know, it was one of those things and I was on house arrest. So, um, it kind of forced me to straighten my shit out that time, Yeah, which was helpful, but then I never got in trouble. Again, so. <laughs> so being on house arrest, I mean, it's literally what it sounds like. I mean, you're con- confined to your quarters. How in that time could you, you grow yourself, grow your business. So what I was saying was, you know, being really limited on what you could do, where you could go, how did, if it was at that point, how did you begin to kind of just embark on your current endeavors? You know, were you just being under the microscope and forced you to kind of just think outside the box? I mean, how did that house arrest time build your career? Definitely forced me because the only time I could do anything was if I went to school or work. So Mm -hmm. I was working at 24 hour fitness at the time. Okay. So I would go and you know, stay at work half the day, which would allow me to work out and stuff, which was nice. I was going to say, so this was kind of really, I guess, uh, starting the baby snowball into, uh, into bigger yeah. and better things. Yeah. Cause I was, uh, working at 24 hour fitness at the time. And then, uh, I decided that, I mean, I think that anybody who wants to get in, whether you're like personal training or anything, first of all, the internet's allowed a lot of people to be online coaches and that's it. And Wait, there's people what? Who are, like, no, <laughs> but there's people I know who 
are online coaches who have never actually trained or coached anyone in person, which blows my mind completely. You yeah. know, like I started, I became a personal trainer 10 years ago now, more than. Wow. And so like I had that first year working at 24 hour <laughs> fitness where I learned a lot and like I trained people in person for like six years before I ever started an online business. And, um, I just think that obviously, you know, being in the corporate world of fitness was really helpful for me at first. But then when I talked to some of my personal trainer friends who did their own thing, you know, independent contractors, I realized that that's how you can make money. Right. So I switched to being an independent contractor and I started like training people at their houses and stuff with home gyms. Only making money for yourself, really. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then I didn't have to, you know, share it with anybody. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's the the personal training thing started to take off, and then I started doing like boot camps all over Reno, mm-hmm. and right. you know, huge turnouts. And then I started traveling to LA to do boot, all that stuff. So I would like, I'd go travel and do these massive boot camps that sometimes like a hundred people would show up to. And at this point in time, all oh. the promotion was on Instagram. Okay, and this was like 2011, I'd say. So I was down in LA doing a big, one of those big boot camps, And then, uh, I got approached by a gym owner down there who asked me to move down and work at his gym. And I knew I had to leave Reno cause my drug problem was getting really bad again. So I didn't really tell anybody I was moving and I just packed up all my shit and left. And then I, that's, I kind of just like left the drug problem in Reno. Literally. And literally. Cause when I got to LA, I didn't know anybody. What was that like? Kind of going, like going full clean slate it was weird it was lonely because obviously when I moved down to LA I didn't tell anybody I was like running away from a drug problem or anything um and I started working at a gym I was very I mean I posted a picture on Instagram yesterday last night of when I was like 110 pounds I saw that split yeah yeah, when I moved down to LA I think I was like 115 like I was still really small and I joined this gym where everybody's like jacked and in incredible shape. And I was like this skinny little, like I thought I was fit. And then I showed up to this place and I was like, oh my God, what have I done? That's, I was just so little. And so it was crazy though, because I got down there and for the first time in my life, I wanted to strength train. I had never strength trained before. It was all like, you know, sprinting and, and cycling. And like, I was, you know, I had done some CrossFit, like conditioning stuff, but I got down there and I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> So I started strength. That was 2012, and that's when I got into like powerlifting and strength training and stuff. And yeah, when this, I got this sounds to, like the Chrissy that I know. This sounds like uh, the origin of yeah. uh, powerlifting, CrossFit, Olympic lifting. So seeing all these people in your new environment was kind of like that spark, that motivation for you to take this new route with fitness. So you weren't a stranger yeah. to the gym or training in any way. You know, going from your childhood through mostly like endurance triathlon training. Yeah boot camp stuff. So what was it really that just drew you into, uh, into the barbell life, into the powerlifting? Um, I was, you know, the gym rise above fitness. Yeah. 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 Uh, That's who's the what? owner of that? Uh, Brandon. He, yeah. He's the singer of bleeding through. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. So I moved down there and I moved in with him and like, he kind of like took me under his wing and, um, I don't know what that gym's like anymore. I haven't set fitness since the day I left orange yeah. County, obviously, yeah. but Um, there was just some incredible coaches there who like trained Olympians and stuff. And I just learned so much from everybody that worked there. Um, and yeah, I just, I mean, I, I had never even done like a barbell squat before when I moved down there and I go in that gym and everybody's doing barbell squats. And I was like, Ooh, I've never done this. (laughs) (laughs) And then, uh, you know, I just like jumped into it and I loved it. The whole time. Did you collect like a new tattoo everywhere you went? Because for those of you who don't know Chrissy, um, she has she has just a couple tattoos, and I see I see her now, and I'm picturing as you transition through all these different phases in your life and seasons of life and literal places in life. Was it kind of like uh, adding a story onto yourself, or what's kind of the the backstory yeah, behind that? Most, but I mean, I don't. I'm not one of those people who's gonna say like every tattoo has a meaning or anything mm-hmm. like that. But it definitely like because of where I've been at and like, like everything I've gotten, I've gotten for a reason. Like there was obviously an idea behind it. And even though some of my tattoos are silly and some of them are more serious, it's like, I kind of just like, yeah, as I went. And then once I realized like, okay, my career's in fitness and you know, I own my own business now. That's when I went for the hands and the neck. Oh, wow. Okay. (laughs) My poor mom was devastated when I did that. (laughs) She was like, what have you done? And I'm like, I'm sorry. I pay the bills in this house. I pay my own. (laughs) 
paycheck. I can do whatever the hell I want. Exactly. Going into this new area in LA, kind of seeing this new this new shiny thing, this new uh, form of training, really mm-hmm. solidified the path that you've been on now. And so I know that uh, you have your own gym. And so mm-hmm. what was it like kind of going from training in someone else's gym, training other people, and then <laughs> embarking upon that huge process of opening up your own facility? It was so crazy how it happened because I didn't, I'm 20, I'll be 29 in a couple months and Mm -hmm. I did not, my, I thought like opening a gym was going to be like a 35 year old Chrissy thing. Like (laughs) that's, that's so adult. That's so adult. Yeah. I was like, Oh yeah, that's like the end goal here, you know? And I was like, I'll own my own gym, like in my thirties, that was the end goal. And so, um, we, I moved to New York, I got sober. So I got sober in May of 2013 and getting sober opened my eyes to how unhealthy mm-hmm. me living in Los Angeles was because the drinking, I left all the drugs behind in Reno, but the drinking was just completely out of control living down there. Yeah. Um, everybody I knew down there drank and partied and we went out every single night. Um, and so the drinking was worse than ever when I lived down there. And then I got sober in May and then about two months went by and I was like, holy shit, I have to leave Southern California. Like this is the most mm-hmm. unhealthy environment. <clears throat> so I sold everything I own and moved to New York city with absolutely no plan. Yeah. I was like, I'm moving to New York city cause I think it's cool there and I don't have a plan. So we got there and I, there was still no plan. Mm-hmm. Um, so I started writing again and then, uh, I just, that's also donuts and deadlifts kind of started around that time too. Like we started donuts and deadlifts in LA, but I didn't start printing t-shirts probably until like four months into living in New York. So everything like slowly unraveled, but I didn't expect donuts and deadlifts to make a million dollars the first year I had it. Wow. I didn't know it was that successful. That's amazing. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah, it, uh, I did, I wasn't expecting that. At all. And granted, like that wasn't like a million dollars in my pocket. That right. Yeah. Totally Revenue. Bad. Yeah. Uh, so I was not expecting that, but I just, obviously I, I, I had never had money before, mm-hmm. you know, like, uh, so I was a little spendy at first cause I was excited <laughs> cause I was just doing like <laughs> rightfully so rightfully so. <laughs> yeah. And then I was like, okay, this is a thing. This is my business now. And I, you know, legitimized the whole thing and just started saving. And then, um, I was like, okay, well, realistically I could open a gym much sooner than I thought. So we started the process of opening a gym in New York city. And, uh, we went through that whole thing. And when it came time to sign the lease, no, none of my, none of my team, I slowly started building my team at that point, looked incredibly excited about a gym in New York city. And they, everyone seemed very wishy-washy on it. And, uh, thank God I didn't do that. Cause I probably would have gone into like financial bankruptcy had I opened the gym in New York city. Oh, so the you, cost. you didn't, you halted that. Yeah. Okay. I literally had the lease in front of me for the building and I just, it didn't feel right. Mm-hmm. So I didn't sign it. And then, so at that point I was like, okay, well, what are we doing here? Mm-hmm. You know? And I had, I had hired, you know, like a GM for donuts and deadlifts I had Ryan who still works for me at the gym today. And then, um, another employee and I, everybody's originally from Reno. And I just said, like, what are we doing? Are we going to end up opening a gym in New York city? Or are we going to get the hell out of here and open a gym somewhere that we all want to like grow roots? So we like toyed around with Portland or Austin or Denver, but mm-hmm. it just came down to everyone wanted to move back to Reno. So moved back to Reno and I opened the gym actually like two years ago today or sometime in these next couple of days. Oh, wow. Happy but- anniversary. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, it was just kind of one of those things where like, I didn't expect it to happen. A gym had closed in Reno, a CrossFit gym because he had another successful business mm-hmm. and I knew his space was up for grabs and his equipment. And I called him and I said, Hey, what do you want for your building and your equipment? And it just worked out incredibly well. I gotta say, uh, listen okay. to your story of your substance abuse, the moving, the business decisions, just really the direction of your life. Um, I feel like you're kind of downplaying these significant, hard conversations you're having with yourself. I mean, you're just like, yeah, yeah I just, I just packed up you know, my car, sold up all my things, and uh, just moved across country. I moved to a different state, a different city. Mm-hmm. Maybe expand upon why you got to that point and how you really just kind of put yourself in front of the mirror and had this hard conversation and made these life changing decisions. Not once, not twice, but multiple times. And at this point in New York, it wasn't just affecting your life. You had a whole team. So you were kind of guiding and directing the life and livelihood of other people. Yeah. I mean, and even still like now I've got 15 employees and so now it's like, you know, even more so, but yeah, I don't know. Like 
I didn't want to leave New York City. I really? could have I could have stayed there forever. Yeah, like I um, my sobriety at the time it was so easy there because there was so much to do. Mm-hmm. There's you know it was one of those things where like I don't I'm not particularly religious, so I, AA didn't really align with me. So I stopped going to AA. I didn't have a sponsor. My method for staying sober has been staying busy. You know, like I'm, I'm notoriously not like all my employees too. Like there's always a million things on my plate or on the us plate collectively at the gym. And yeah. uh, for me, it's like, I have to be busy all the time and I always have to have a project and be working on something in order to stay sober. So that's in New York. That was easy. There was always something to do. There was, you know, that's, and I thought I was going to like end up living there for the rest of my life. So when I realized that the people who had moved there to like help me with donuts and deadlifts and all that stuff weren't happy there, I told myself like, okay, we need to do something different because those people are important to me. So that's a big, that's a big girl move. That's uh, really selfless. Um, I mean, cause at this point, I mean, it's really your baby. It was your idea. You're creating this movement and wanted to create this brick and mortar location, but the people you had brought with you were really feeling differently. So, uh, I mean, that's a huge ego check. Yeah, it was really hard, but it was one of those things where I just, I knew as, you know, especially like the further I get into my sobriety and like at that point in time, I I was a business owner and I knew I had to do what was also going to be best for the business. And I know the other thing that's nice about Reno is everybody saw what I went through in high school and college here and people were more than willing to support me here because they had seen the changes and a lot of people were like very proud of everything I'd done. So I knew that I wouldn't fail in Reno. What was that homecoming like? It sounds like a uh, a prodigal daughter returns to, <laughs> to Reno. Weird because I would still come back and visit because my parents were here and stuff. But like honestly, it was kind of like a like a big ego thing. Like it was like, oh, I moved to LA and then New York City, and I had yeah. all these businesses, and then I. Like I definitely at the, at that point in time, I was kind of like, I cared what people were going to think if I like came back to Reno because it wasn't because I failed elsewhere. You know, it just, it came down to where do I want to grow my roots, Mm -hmm. settle down because LA and New York obviously weren't the right place for it. So at first I was like kind of afraid of what people would think. And then when we got here and I, you know, just all the support, um, it was funny because I'd go out, you know, and like involve myself in the community or whatever. And there was people who would see me who hadn't seen me since I left Reno the first time. And they would say to me, like, I don't think I've ever seen you sober before. Wow. And that was crazy to hear. What's uh, what's that like, you know, having been through addiction <laughs> for a long time, most of your life, it sounds like. And then people tell you that. Was. That's got to hit hard. Yeah. And the first time I heard it, I was like, what? No. And then I thought about the last time I had seen that person and about how like a lot of the people who went to high school with me saw me start drinking as a freshman, you yeah. seen as like a junior. And then I drank and used all through college, you know? And so then like, I was thinking about it and like in college I was intoxicated every single day. I'd put, wow. I'd buy boxes of Franzia, the bagged <laughs> wine, put it in my backpack <laughs> And walk around campus. You know, I would be lying if I said I have never done something similar. Um, So like I was telling you earlier, you know, I was in the military for about six years. And for a while, I mean, it's not quite house arrest, but you go through these certain phases before you get into what's called, you know, the real army, your regular gaining unit. And so you're still in training and certain hours you have to stay within your room in the barracks. And uh, they would come by and do pop in room inspections. I had a camelback on my back. I had one for training when I was out in the field and another devoted one that was like Jack and Coke or (laughs) something. So, um, but uh, you know, mine was a little bit different, but you know, I can definitely attest to uh, sneaking stuff in where it doesn't really belong. Yeah. So I'd hear that when I got back home and I was like, dang. And then people started telling me like every single time they saw me, you know, and people still tell me just the other day I went to like a, my friend opened a bikini shop she and makes her own bikinis here in town I went to the grand opening and it was like basically a big high school and college reunion yeah and everybody was just like I am so proud of you and I was like for what and they're like <laughs> you should be dead <laughs> does that make it more real for you I mean because you had kind of hit a, a few points in this timeline where you're talking about like I was I was abandoning the drugs and moving locations you know handling my sobriety but mm-hmm. that was just you you were having those conversations with yourself and you were kind of your own checks and balances How does that affect you when it's literally your hometown, your friends, your family, and all these other people? Yeah, I definitely feel like 
here I have more of a support system, so to speak, because what I didn't have in LA or New York really was people that knew old Chrissy, Mm -hmm. you know, like even still, like I have like some of my employees now, they didn't know me when I was crazy. So what's really crazy is for when people like, you know, people from high school or college come to the gym and the employees hear stories and they're like, no way. Like they don't believe it. (laughs) I think that's a big, a big testament as to like old, old us versus new us, or Mm -hmm. even really just, you know, present us. Uh, So you have people from your hometown that knew one version of Chrissy. You have new people, your employees, you know, in your new life in the gym as current Chrissy. Um, what's it been like kind of, uh, connecting the dots between the two? (laughs) It's like, I don't know, it's, there's times when like it'll turn into storytelling time and, uh, it's like, there's sometimes like I'll tell stories and it's like almost hard for me to say it Mm -hmm. to know that I used to be that way. But yeah, there's people who work for me now and they're like, I just can't imagine you doing something like that just because of like the complete one. I mean, I was a shithead when I was, (laughs) you know, drinking and partying and using and stuff like that. Whereas like now I feel like I'm really... Like I'm like definitely like a do-gooder and <laughs> I'm that person from, that like puts all from the shithead to do-gooder. Groups. I think that's what I'll make the yeah. title for the episode. <laughs> yeah. I put the uh, I every time we go like grocery shopping, I walk around the parking lot and put all the stray carts back in the cart return. <laughs> that is definitely like, the definition of a do-gooder. That's for sure. I'm like that person. Like I won't walk on anyone's grass. I'll go all the way. Around. It's funny. <laughs> I just want to talk to everybody and ask everybody's days going. Yeah. And, yeah. And speaking of significant others and talking about your support system, I know you're married and mm-hmm. I know for me that is a huge support system and the good days, the bad days, the shithead days. Um, where along this timeline did you meet your husband and how did that process happen? He came into the gym a day we were actually closed and I wasn't even at the gym. Mm-hmm. You know Karina Miller? Karina Bay Miller? Name sounds familiar. I can't put a name to a face right now though. She's- um, a USAPL powerlifter, bodybuilding.com girl. Yes, um, yes, yes, yes. Okay, there it is. Okay, so she's engaged to Gabe Chris, mm-hmm. who's the bassist in Whitechapel. Yep. So Ben's the drummer He's for drummer, Whitechapel. Right, yeah. yeah, so they were playing a, a show here, and Gabe texted me and was like, hey, can we go to the gym? I'm like, I'm out of town, and the gym's closed, but I'll have Ryan come let you guys in. So I text Ryan. I was like, hey, will you go to the gym and let Gabe and those guys from the band in? And Ryan's like, oh, hell yeah. He's like a super good <laughs> So he comes and lets him in. And I was like, yeah, get a picture of Whitechapel being in the gym and yeah. post it on, on the Instagram. And he did. And I saw a picture of Ben. And I was like texting Gabe. I was like, who is that? <laughs> <laughs> who is that? And so it was like funny how it works because Ben and I had like never actually met in person. Uh-huh. He had followed me on Instagram and stuff. And like – we built like a friendship first and, you know, we spent like every day FaceTiming and then I flew out to Tennessee and then he never having met in real life, he agreed to go to Glacier National Park with me. Oh, wow. And I was like, yeah, we're going to go backpack 50 miles in four days. And he's like, all right, cool, let's do it. And yep. he was secretly yep. terrified. I found out later. Our first day so, we got a movie. So I think you guys want up this. <laughs> So yeah, I flew to Tennessee and we, you know, went to REI and bought all the shit we needed and flew to Montana and went backpacking in the middle of 50 miles. That's amazing. Like days. <clears throat> and then that was kind of all she wrote. So was he, uh, was he doing this to meet you for you or was he, um, you know, about, was he an active gym rat he's, kind of person too? Yeah. He's, yeah. He's always been into like powerlifting. Like he used to CrossFit and then powerlifting and then, uh, he had done like the outdoorsy backpacking stuff when he was a lot younger, mm-hmm. like 18, 19. But, um, yeah, he was more than willing. He's like, let's just go backpack and hang out in a national park with no cell service for five days. Let's go spend a week trying not to get eaten by bears. That's cool. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> so yeah. And then, yeah, it kind of just worked out perfectly, but no, he's like the most incredible person and in past relationships I've been in. The dudes have been like, insecure about my social media following or just, you know, Mm -hmm. how I am as a person. And he's never once like held anything like that against me. And we've never even been in a fight. Wow. That's impressive. I got to say you guys, um, I see a lot of your Twitter posts and Instagram pictures. Um, you are a person that I really like hold up on a high pedestal, no pressure, (laughs) but, uh, it's just always reassuring to see other people that are in significant relationships in marriages that always put on the other person and mm-hmm. in this day and age it's so easy to just be like 
shady and to have those insecurities, like you said, you know, of just the way the world is now with social media and the way that certain people try to pursue their passions and business and putting yourself out there emotionally, physically, and, you know, in the fitness world, I mean, really your body, you are your business card. And so, I mean, I think that would definitely be easy for a guy to uh, be like, Hey babe, how about we shut down the Instagram and uh, we sell only like onesies from now on? <laughs> yeah, I had a uh, my my previous relationship. He he demanded I delete my Instagram. Demanded, like, wow. You do it, and he worked at the gym, uh-huh. and I was like, you do understand that you are employed mm-hmm. by the gym as the head coach here, and that you know, and it just made no sense to me. And he wanted me to delete my Instagram, and I was like, you're insane. You have the life you have because of my Instagram. Okay, so this is kind of this is segueing into I think a really cool direction that I wasn't planning on, um, relationship stuff. And what's it like being in a relationship where the other person is asking, forcing, demanding you to make these changes for them versus now being in a relationship where it's you are you, they are themselves, and then you have this coexistence in the middle. Yeah, I think, I don't know, the other thing too I should probably make note of, which this is obviously very well known and out there, is my previous relationship, um, we started, we got together kind of recently after I got sober, and mm-hmm. he has mental illness, he has bipolar disorder, okay. so it was very, un, it was very unhealthy. <clears throat> um, so that's going to play another variable for sure. Yeah, because of how we were both managing our illnesses, mm-hmm. and we were individually trying to manage them instead of manage them together, because he didn't understand that to me, alcohol and addiction is an illness. Mm -hmm. And then I can't put myself in someone's shoes who has bipolar disorder. And so the difference is, is he would take medication and every single day I wished that I could manage my illness by taking a pill. Sure. That would be much easier. Yeah. But to him, he hated the medication and every day he wished he could manage his illness by going to a meeting and talking to other people with it. Wow. So it's kind of one of those things where we like envied each other Mm -hmm. a little bit. But, um, I don't know, there was just nothing ever really clicked there and the holding everything against me, I posted on the internet. Um, you know, he didn't, he didn't understand why I was so like vulnerable and opened up to people all the time when to me, it's like, I've never been the strongest or the fittest and I don't, I'm never going to motivate anybody Mm -hmm. in that way because I'm like, I'm relatively strong ish when I'm not injured, which is all the time. (laughs) But I feel like for me at this point in my life and even in the past couple of years, like I'm, I'm looked at as more of like a business owner now and an entrepreneur and somebody who's sober. I don't, I don't, I don't feel like I'm known for being an athlete. You know, I'm a relatively fit business owner who just so happens to compete in CrossFit and powerlifting. You know, I can definitely relate. I, um, I always joke. I seem to always find and surround myself by people that are significantly stronger than me, uh, who have, you know, better physiques and they're in the same industry as me. And so you always kind of feel, I would think that most people would feel this, I don't know, infer- inferiority complex or this need to kind of like not be around those people because it's going to make yourself look bad. But I think you and I both, we just, we love what we love. We love this world and we know that we can still help people. We're relatable to people. Um, you know, I've been through a lot of injuries. You seem to break your foot and back like all the time. <laughs> uh, I forget, I forget your most recent injury, but I've been kind of like following along your, your trail and success back into the gym with it. But, um, yeah, it, I think it just goes to show that I think this profession, fitness, exercise, honestly, I think of this as like the living profession because as humans, we're meant to just be healthy, living, moving creatures. And, uh, you know, there's not meant to be a strongest, slimmest, thickest, sexiest, ripped version of ourselves. And so I think just being solidified in your progress and your successes is a testament in and of itself. So what is on deck for you next? What are you doing now? If you're uh, nursing your way through an injury, getting back into uh, the swing of things, what's on deck for Chrissy right now? Luckily, the injury isn't painful anymore. It's my knee. I just blew my knee out over the summer. Um, so luckily, it, ooh, it just made a really bad sound, though. That was your uh, knee? Yeah, you heard that? Oh, I, thought, I thought you hit your desk or something. Oh, no, man. that was my knee popping. So it's not painful anymore, but now I'm just weak. You know, I less, this time last year, I competed about a year ago, and, you know, I was squatting 315 and benching 175 and deadlifting wow. 385, and now... I'm, it's on a good day. I can squat 185 Mm. bench is still there. And then deadlifting on a good day, I can deadlift like 300. 
So it's been like a huge blow to my ego. I'm thinking about competing in July, Mm -hmm. um, but I'm not entirely sure. I don't want to compete just for the sake of trying to stay relevant in powerlifting because I don't really care anymore. Um, But I actually just um, started the process of starting my nonprofit. Oh, nice. Okay. So um, So, is it too soon to divulge any details about that or uh, what's that process like? It's called Reps for Recovery. Um, and basically I started the GoFundMe for crowdfunding to get a head start on it. And so I was able to raise like almost $4,000 in like a couple days, which was nice. So I give out free gym memberships to people in recovery at Mm -hmm. Black Iron Gym. So we've got like 15 people or so here on free memberships, but, um, financially that's kind of tough because I have to pay my coaching staff and you know, it's just, it costs a cost for you. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's, it's definitely, I mean, there's people who will say like, well, giving away a free gym membership doesn't cost anything, but it does because I pay per athlete for our gym software. They're getting nutrition coaching from one of my, co- you mm-hmm. know, and then they're getting coached by someone on my staff. So I have to pay my staff, obviously, mm-hmm. um, you know, and so we, we started the GoFundMe for people to donate. So that's helped offset the cost. And then the goal is to fund other gyms who want to implement the program as well. Nice. So I give them like you know like a monthly stipend depending on how many people they have so um that's you know in the works right now which is really exciting and stressful and terrifying all at the same time <laughs> any new venture is uh, that same yep. fine line of exciting and terrifying all at the same time okay. yeah well awesome um i want to ask a couple last few questions here one of which going back to i was talking about earlier uh your tattoos your a walking, talking work of art. So <laughs> what's uh, what's maybe one or two of your favorite tattoos? One maybe that's just for fun and one maybe that has uh, the most important meaning behind it to you. Hmm. I have – so I love punk rock. I'm a huge mm-hmm. punk rock girl. So I have the black flag bars on my calf, but they're maple bars. Uh. <laughs> so there's like four maple bars staggered on the back of my calf and that's one of my favorite one ever black flag maple bars yeah. um and then i actually have a sobriety tattoo uh i used to drink a bottle of jameson a night before i got sober wow <laughs> so wow. i have a whiskey bottle uh tattooed on my calf with a dagger through it that says r.i.p old friend very nice so, i like that <laughs> yeah that's definitely one of my probably more meaningful ones. Okay. And then I also have a, a girl dancing with the devil with a blindfold on. Uh, so that's another pretty meaningful one I as well. We, I think we could all use that tattoo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just quickly did an interpretation in my head of what I think that means. And I, yeah, I think we're all probably blindly dancing with the devil. I mean, I'm not yeah. a girl, but uh, I do look good in a dress. <laughs> Kidding, kidding, kidding. <laughs> I believe it. <laughs> yeah, like I was describing earlier, the premise and goal behind Everforward Radio and what those two words mean to me is that I'm trying to be the platform, bring the spring springboard for others to tell their story and to mm-hmm. let other people know that they may be going through something similar, if not exactly the same, and you know, there is hope on the other side. So with that being said, what would you say in the products and or services that you provide, how does Donuts and Deadlifts, how does Black Iron Gym, how does you, Chrissy May Cagney, help others live a life ever forward? One thing we always talk about at the gym is like there's no clicks here and there's no, I mean, there's no like, there's no like alpha people anywhere in the gym and we're definitely a gym made up of weirdos and misfits and people nice. from all nice. different backgrounds and like our big thing here is we just always let everybody know it's perfectly okay to be yourself. Um, you know, I've got employees, I have black employees, I've got, um, transgender employees, gay, you know, and we're the gym that's really well known for being like gay friendly, transgender friendly, you know, like we've got all different denominations of people here. And, um, I just wish more people would feel comfortable being exactly who they are at all times. And like, it's okay to be vulnerable, you know, and put yourself out there emotionally and stuff. And I think a lot of people are afraid to get hurt, but like being heard is, you know, you grow from that and it's part of life and we all, you know, experience pain. And even though it's all unique, we're kind of all in it together. So people at this gym and, you know, all my employees and all my sponsored athletes, everyone's like, we talk about our feelings a lot. (laughs) (laughs) Everyone just really loves each other a whole bunch here. And I think that a lot of my employees have said, 
you know, especially Chloe, who's the general manager for Donuts and Deadlifts, and she's pretty well known in the fitness industry. She, Chloe's, um, she had a sex change about 10 years ago. She went male to female. Uh, she's five foot four and 130 pounds and competed in mm. CrossFit and CrossFit told her you can't compete as a woman. And really? so it was a really well-known story, you know, like four or five years mm. ago, four years ago, I think it was. And she said she spent, you know, she moved here a year ago and she said she spent three years feeling like she couldn't be herself anywhere. Mm. And then she got here and, you know, was just around the crew and all this. And she just feels like she's found home, you know, and that's how a lot of people at the gym feel. So. That's awesome. Sometimes uh, you have to leave home to find your home, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, Chrissy, yeah. thank you so much for being on today. Um, yeah. I, uh, I love what you're doing w with your own ventures, the nonprofit, the Black Iron Gym, and of course, Donuts and Delos is uh, the way yeah. of my heart. <laughs> when I was living in Richmond, Virginia, before I moved up to D.C. about two years ago, it's funny. I, I don't know if this is like the universe smiling upon me, but the gym I used to go to, I had to pass going to and leaving this mm -hmm. most amazing donut shop ever. So I literally, I would go work out and on the way home. I would get donuts probably at least like twice a week. Which shop is it? Uh, you've been there actually, Sugar Shack. Sugar Shack. Yeah, yeah. Did I used to go there. Do you know that the owner of Sugar Shack hires uh, people who have like been in trouble? I could definitely see that because I know some people who have. Um, been through some stuff and then I know they've had problems getting jobs and then I literally see them working doing something with uh, Sugar Shack so yeah, I guess that he, makes sense he only hires people like fresh out of uh, like probation or rehab or jail that's awesome I, I love hearing second chance stories that's awesome yeah, so that's yeah. super place for more than just having awesome donuts <laughs> well uh, I guess if I want that big of a discount um, maybe I'll go I'll go rob I'll go rob them and see if they can hire me afterwards there you go yeah <laughs> you get that employee discount yeah right awesome uh, Christy thanks again for being on you're doing great things and I uh, look forward to seeing what uh, the rest of 17 has for you thank you sir all right